Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're on episode six, actually, of uh, Ethan McKinley's Questionable with his eminent co-host and producer, Alex Bell. Uh, I don't know how we've actually got this lucky, Alex. I guess we'd like to dedicate and thank uh, the show and thank uh, Larry Ann Richards, Robert Perino, uh, Ricky Dance, and uh, Lillian Massey have made this possible. Uh, we literally have a living legend on the show. Uh, I guess growing up in the 80s, you get very obsessed with electronic music. I certainly did anyway, uh, from the soundtracks of John Carpenter, uh, to Giorgio Moroder, I guess, later in the decade. But the guy that started it all off uh, was a man called Steve Strange uh, and his band Visage, starting off in the Blitz in 1979. He and Rusty Egan, I guess, were the most influential cultural icons of that age, really. Without you and Rusty, and I guess the Blitz, who wouldn't have Billy Idol, Susie Sue, uh, no, Roy George. Su actually, Susie Sue before. Billy Idol I used to work for. Um, yeah, the Blitz, um, my nephews are quite... Um, in a sense, cool. But they said to me, um, <laughs> "What's a pop? What's a mod?" Because they they've heard me talk about punk rock. Mods and rockers. What's a mod? And I went, "Well, it's came a little bit before the new romantic. Oh, new romantics were in our history in our history books today at school, and they were talking about you in the history books." <laughs> wow. And we, we, did you always wear makeup, then, Auguste? <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah." And they like a lot more kids, a lot more. But um. But they also like to talk about guy liner and mascara, which is like pathetic. It's, it's eyeliner. It's mascara. Well, I s someone said that to me in a conversation. Well, just call it eyeliner. Why do you have to like butch up and say yeah, it feels I less mean, gay you know, for you to wear? Men, it's ridiculous. Like, where I'm from, right, is deep in the valleys of Wales. And um, when I was 12, I was banned from school for having bright orange hair. <laughs> I mean, men were like seen to be as very really effeminate if they even wore deodorant. <laughs> so they're like, you'd go um, to a chemist to buy deodorant, and it was like you'd be like looking around <laughs> to see if anybody was watching you picking up deodorant. And it's it's one like, down from condoms, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, yeah, even condoms. Even when um, Madness did that really uh, comedy sketch about you know being like going in to the the chemist to get them that was quite actually how it worked um <laughs> you know like trying to sort of ask when there was nobody in the shop about con you know uh, to get some a condom con con yeah. con more please <laughs> <laughs> so yeah wales what was it like growing up in like wor working class wales is this flamboyant <laughs> character or this burgeoning flamboyant character with ideas of clothing and makeup um, and I, all i can say it was thanks to my art school teacher I started to go off the rails at the age of 12 when my hair was... Um, I was banned from school for having bright orange hair. And I thought, great, I've got... Is that naturally bright orange? We, we were a ginger and they just picked on you because no. you were a ginger? <laughs> no, no, it was uh, my, my mum's sister, um, where I suppose I could get away with quite a lot, was like the hairdresser in the village where we actually lived. So um, all of like the products, hair products, in my auntie's shop were given to me by my mum's sister. So if my mum had any arguments with me, all I'd say was, oh, my auntie gave it me, so I, I was playing around with it. It was your but chemistry set of sorts then, I guess, right? In a sort of way. But I mean, <laughs> at, um, I heard my mum when the school authorities come round saying, look, we really have to tell you that your son is going off the rails. Um, my mum turned around and said, I don't understand. He's a grade A student, and I don't understand by having orange hair how it's going to affect his education. Yeah. But at that time, I hadn't started to rebel, and, yeah. I, stu and I hadn't started to go Except for the orange hair, yeah. That's all. But exactly. I mean, which, which, as she's, as it she didn't says, affect my really educa education. And I just heard my mum say, and I thought, yes. And I thought, oh, great, a l another few more weeks off school. You have an ally. And then it did get a little bit more serious, and the school authorities came down, and a letter came saying that if my hair didn't go back to a sort of What was their reasoning, though? I mean, I suppose, is it the reasoning that schools usually have that it's distracting, it was distracts the other students? Dis or yeah, that was a, it. Well, it's like it's prison, isn't it? Everyone's in a uniform, everyone has this very bland look, and here he, he appears like this sparkling I mean, of course, glitter. the thing is, if the school don't make a fuss about it, then it won't cause a fuss. <laughs> Really? Yeah, it was it was the school it was the school like really that yeah. were you know like just putting the foot down, but I mean, in the sense of uniforms and things like that, you're right. I I never like listen. I never like stuck 
to the uniform, I'd be like wearing a twin set. Yeah. I just cut my tie Oxford off, that was the extent of my rebellion. Oxford bags and sort of, uh, I remember having massive platforms <laughs> and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I had to dye it sort of to a, a more neutral color. Was this to emulate Ziggy Stardust in any way? Like <coughs> yeah, I think it thing. was. Yeah. I think that was my first sort of, um, I've been influenced by music um, more in the sense of sort of glam rock bands like Sweet, Blockbuster. Mm. Um, um, there was another band which... The, the mud? Not Mud, no. Not, never Mud. Um, but um, Single Bed, the band was called Fox. And she, uh, she had a, an a most amazing voice. Mm. And she, I think they only had one hit. Um, but then this character, David Bowie, came along and so did Brian Ferry. Mark Bolin? Mark Bolin first, maybe, actually. Mm. Um, and I sort of got into that field of music. But um, when I dyed my hair, there was another girl at school that, kept, that we both did it together. Yeah. And we were sort of having this sort of, it was my first sort of on-off love relationship with this sort of girlfriend at the time at school. Um, and we got known as like the terrible duo of the school, you know, like we were like the Bonnie and Clyde, sort of, and we were sort <laughs> of glam rock like, Bonnie um, and Clyde. We were, were like known to be like the terrible duo, and, um, and if anything went wrong, the blame was more or less pointed at me and her. Um, but then I sort of, um, re I remember going for pinups, and there was one record store. Um, nowhere near where I lived um, in Newbridge. In Newbridge, they didn't have a record store, but I, I knew if I went to Ponty Pool, which was like uh, a bus ride away, five miles on the bus, I knew if I got there early enough in the morning, this store would have maybe three copies of pinups. So if I got there early enough, I would be the proud owner of pinups. Yeah. But I'd already got yeah. Hunky Dory, um, Ziggy Stardust. There was a kind of splitting glam, I think, in the 70s. You had that kind of art school glam that was Bowl and, and Ferry and uh, Bowie. And then you've got this kind of like football terrace glam that was like Mud and the Sweet and stuff. Do you think more of the kind of... I like Sweet um, in a sense. I thought Brian Connolly sort of had a look about him, which wasn't like, like Mud to me with Tiger Feet and the way that they dressed, um, especially either the guitarist or the bass player with their big dangly earrings, where it was a bit naff. Yeah. Um, Slade to some element at the beginning I thought were quite cool until again they Dave Hill's costumes started going a bit too OTT. Was that the base city rollers as well? Was it? Uh, was that? Uh, they kind of went. For that I kind of like didn't really. The cut off plaid trousers and the shoes that was a kind of Sladey kind of thing as well. But I guess they predated the base city rollers, right? I don't know. They're not glam. I, don't I know really that. didn't grow. I mean, I do vaguely remember a bit about the basis of Rose, but not much. Mm. Um, I think I think I was a bit too, maybe a bit too young or a bit too old to remember <laughs> the basic role. But when NAF compared to Bowie, of course. But um, yeah, uh, then I went out, I went completely out of that phase, not um, dissing Roxy Music or dissing Bowie, but I started hanging around an older element of. Um, peers who when I was sort of 13 14 these guys were like 16 and they got into Northern Soul mm. yeah. and Northern Soul was um, at the time at Wigan Casino or at Blackpool Mecca and they used to have all dayers or nighters <laughs> never stood any alcohol and so by the age of 14 I was like a speed freak <laughs> <laughs> and I'd hitchhike from where I lived in Wales. In five I'd minutes. <laughs> I'd, hitch, speed. <laughs> I'd hitchhike um, as far as I could to get, um, I knew in Wolverhampton a coach would go to Blackpool Mecca. So I knew if I got as far as Wolverhampton, I'd be, I'd definitely get a coach. Which How I far could, ahead in time would you have to hitchhike to get to Wolverhampton? Was that a big thing in the 70s, like hitchhiking? Yeah. Could you pull that off, yeah? You just go in the morning and just hope you got there in time. <laughs> and generally, I did. And generally, I got back for school on Monday morning, <laughs> having gone to um, Blackpool Mecca on the Saturday. <laughs> Wigan, 
casino which started at 12 and went through till 8 the next morning okay. then went swimming in this local um, wing casino swimming <laughs> pool then changed of clothing which was like massive flared trousers with high waistband you had to have leather soles shoes so you could like backflip and slide slide across the floor leather sole shoes and like bowling alley shirts um, very much a f like a flick hair haircut, um, and then maybe go to an all day like at the Twisted Wheel if they had it revived because the Twisted Wheel was long before um, Wing Casino. But then they did a revival, and they also had all day as at Bristol. But then I used to get back to school on Monday, and I was like a complete and utter zombie. <laughs> <laughs> My mouth was down. <laughs> and some the teacher would go, Stephen, are you sleeping in the background? <laughs> no! And I'd be like, um, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, I couldn't, couldn't string a sentence together. I was just like, uh, uh, wanting to go to sleep. And then I would most probably drift off to sleep. And my wife would go, and then, Stephen! <laughs> and the, it depended on what teacher it was. Um, and then my art teacher, Mr. Gwyn, sort of said to me, look, Steve, you're definitely going off the rails, um, but I'm going to give you some advice. He said, um, I want you to compile an art portfolio because out of all of the work that's hanging up in the school, yours is, if anything, by far the best art student we've ever had in the, stu in the school. Whoa. So, oh, and nice. if, you compile, if you do compile an art, on our portfolio, mm -hmm. he said, I think by your behavior, you're not gonna go down the field of- You're not gonna work in a bank. That gonna, no, it wasn't even that. You're not gonna play rugby, <laughs> or you're not gonna go and work down the wines. And then I started to um, get really involved in this sort of subculture. A punk hadn't even started, but- where are, um, we now, are we in about 74 now then? Or no, no, no. It was about 75-ish, yeah. Sure. Um, I started to put a band. I put the Sex Pistols on long before they did the Bill Grundy show. Mm. And um, I think once the curtains went back, I remember that Johnny Rotten was more shocked by the audience being more outrageous. Is this in, obviously, Wales? In Newport, yeah, yeah. yeah, in a club called The Soway. <laughs> so you were booking them into the clubs, right? Yeah, yeah. and I was doing the artwork. And oh, then awesome. I remember doing the artwork for Generation X, which was Billy Idol's band, first, first band. Yeah. Then I put The Stranglers on, and that was my first sexual experience with a man. Because um, afterwards, Johnny, well, I, I've said it in my book, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, Sean Jack Bunnell, who was the only good looking one in the band, all of a sudden he sort of hooked on to me. <laughs> and he was like, I don't fancy going back to London tonight. Where do you live? And I went, Well, with me mum. <laughs> <laughs> with my mum. And um, I said, There's nowhere near here. He goes, Oh, that's all right. We'll get a taxi. <laughs> so I thought, Why do you want to? It didn't occur to me at all. <laughs> Nobody knew what gay was. And I mean, yeah. that is honest. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Like, it's so... A more innocent uh, time, wasn't it? Yeah. You My mother didn't know until she was sort of almost 30, I think. Or something. Well, yeah, it, actually, actually, going back to that story, that's the first experience I had with a man. Yeah. I thought, what the hell's going on? Mm. You know? And... My mum said to me, why did that man stay last night? Well, that man was like maybe at the time, maybe about eight years older than me. So maybe it was seemed to be a little bit mm. perverse. But yeah. Well, I guess you were much older back in the day as well. It's like a 24 year old now isn't going to be like a 24 year old in the 70s, right? No. And no. also there's a, like, <clears throat> like now, for instance, like I, I mean, I would talk to 15 year old kids now mm. and I talk to them as if they were like, your peers well like, like well i would i wouldn't talk down to them no, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh but my mum said to me recently Stephen, you've got to be careful you know right uh, especially because somebody where i live has just been a 30 year old man has just been arrested for being a bloody paedophile mm. but then again you i wouldn't take 15 year old kids into my flat and ply them with cannabis joints mm. <laughs> so there's a whole you know there's whole a difference. but in going back to that um that age um, element of like things that people did 
it was a much more innocent, like hitchhiking. You wouldn't actually think That's of the dangers or anything it, yeah. like that. But going back to the, to the art portfolio, when I put the pistols on and Glenn Matlock, who, who to me the was the brains the pistols, right? and yeah. who wrote every, every great song with pistols, mainly put together, Malcolm McLaren decided that he didn't want him in the band because he was too public school. Mm. Um, after, and, he, and then he wanted to bring in Sid Vicious. But Glenn saw my, my um, portfolio and said, I don't think you really want to live in this town. I don't think you belong in this town. Yeah. He said, if you ever think about wanting to live in London, you can actually come and sleep on my sofa. Oh. So I was just like, I, I, Again? I, 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 <laughs> you know, really? Only, and he gave me his phone number. Wow. But, and then we didn't have a phone. So I used to make this pilgrimage. It was like a, like a mile and a half walk to the bottom of the hill to a phone box. And I'd phone and I'd be hoping he'd be there. He'd pick up the phone. I'd go, Hi, Glenn. It's Steve, the boy from the stowaway in Newport. <laughs> um, when I've got enough money, can I come and stay on your sofa? Yes, of course you can. And I'm sure he was like, who have I given this number to? <laughs> and, every, and every week I'd be saving up my money. And then I told my mum I'd got over a hundred and odd quid. I didn't really. I had about 40 pounds. And my mum was so worried. She was driving me to Newport Station thinking I was going to get the train. But as soon as she took me to the station and she'd dri driven off, I literally jumped over the barrier, got to where the London sign was, stuck my thumb up and hitched. And I just had 40 pounds in my pocket. Then... I really didn't look back. I ended up staying with Glenn, ended up meeting Susie, ended up meeting Billy. I was working for Malcolm McLaren and doing artwork at Glitter Best. Then the Sex Pistols did uh, the Bill Grundy show and they were known as the most filthy, lewd, um, outspoken band that had ever been on the TV airways. I mean, they swore, basically. Yeah. And it's very tame. You know, if anybody looks back at that now, they think, really? <laughs> Is that what caused such furore? Is that how Malcolm met you then? Did they recommend him to you to work with? Glenn From did. what they knew from in Wales? Glenn did, yeah. yeah Glenn yeah. did, yeah. Um, what was he like as a character? I didn't really get on with Malcolm. Malcolm actually liked taking the credit, like... One of the reasons he didn't want Glenn in the band because Glenn was like the musician mm -hmm. and who who was the main songwriter. Glenn, uh, Malcolm liked to manipulate the band with exactly how he did with Sid Vicious. Sid Vicious couldn't play bass. Right. Um, so it was like a band that he was controlling. But after the Bill Grundy thing, the whole anarchy in the UK tour, out of 30 dates... There was most probably six left. And I remember being on that tour and there was sort of an intrusion, not an intrusion, an infusion of American acts brought in to go on the tour, along with The Clash and Johnny Thunder and The Heartbreakers, um, Lee Black Childers, the photographer, um, who did some great pictures of Bowie, did some great pictures of the punk, um, also brought in a... Uh, Je uh, at the time was it Wayne <laughs> County at the time who then later became a uh, Jane County Cherry Vanilla and uh, I part of my job on the Anakin in the Utah, UK tour because um, by this time Jamie Reed had come in yeah. to do the artwork so I wasn't so happy and I knew that Billy was signing Billy Idol was signing a deal with A&M Records and he was saying right. to me you're too good to be working with Malcolm. I want you to meet my manager and come over to A&M. Anyway, so we did the tour. And I noticed on this, like, when I was waking up, the American, like, posse, that there was something else going on with this punk. And heroin had been brought in right. to the whole thing. So a lot of the American bands were actually jacking up. Mm. I mean, I've, got a f I've always had phobias to needles. Mm. I mean, even with my drug use, I... I could never. I was going to ask: Is it was it smoked off foil? Was it chased them dragon as opposed to injecting? Or no, they were injecting. They were injecting. They were injecting so it, that sort of like freaked me out yeah. like a lot. Yeah. Um, that anyway, that 
period of my life changed when I sort of m left McLaren. Still kept in very good contact with Glenn, although he left the Sex Pistols, because he then struck up a band with the Rich Kids, yeah, which nice. had Rusty in, and also Mijio. And at the time, my, myself, Susie, Billy, who then, uh, and Berlin, Philip Salad, which got known as the Bromley contingent for a while. Mm. Um, but I'd also started to look for various different venues because the National Front and the British movement were also getting involved in the punk rock scene mm. by introducing bands like Screwdriver, okay. Sham 69, very poli politically incorrect and also very violent. Mm. So was that part of the image or was that a message they actually believed behind uh, the words? Was it just kind of... I think it was using let's, that Let's to just get these bands into this movement yeah. and see what, you know, we, we can actually... What leverage we can get. Up, yeah. Kind of yeah, what <laughs> leverage Saber we can get. Yeah. And also, it was, it was very much... Um, like For me, it was really annoying because Susie and the Banshees, for me, were one of my favourite bands. Right. And then you'd see on the bill Screwdriver and their fans were just like completely anybody wearing Vivian Westwood they weren't beaten true up. punks yeah. they needed right. to be beaten up in the the skinhead's eyes okay. and it become like it became like and also <coughs> the Did tabloids had got on, got on hold of it so they mm -hmm. were telling you how to rip up your clothes <laughs> safety pin them back together <laughs> how to put a safety pin in your nose well, when, that happens, when it's it, not when it even anymore, right? when it wasn't even pierced yeah. So it was, for me, time to find a different venue. Right. So Midge and Rusty um, were off doing the Rich Kids. So I helped to earn some money by helping out with their fan club. But the fan club, it sort of gave <coughs> me a base because I had the keys mm. to this beautiful place <laughs> on um, where is it? somewhere in the heart of London. And a really... Pay palatial address near where the EMI, the original EMI um, offices used oh, to be. Oh, wow, okay. Um, not Harley Street. Near Harley Street. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, Warren Street, maybe? No, 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 no. no. That's long, that's long the other way. way. Um, <laughs> but it, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an illegal place. It, yeah. This was like an office right. where yeah. the rich kids' management were. Yeah. And they were on their, their fan club and their, um, the just the everything was run from there from fan club to the way that records were designed so the art team were there the management the secretaries mm -hmm. so it was this massive palatial flat yeah. with like different rooms so i had the keys so i could just dust there on the sofa <laughs> when everybody'd gone home i'd go and get wrecked pissed out of my head and <laughs> crawl back to this really palatial place very near Harley Street had the keys to it and just as long as I was up before 10 o'clock <coughs> yeah, so before anyone yeah. found before you, anybody yeah. found me I was fine yeah. um, that lasted or did they think that you just got into work really early <laughs> yeah then that sort of <laughs> lasted, working all night <laughs> that sort of lasted for a while um, but in between this then I was approached by so many um, other sort of entrepreneur managers like who thought they were on the field of like McLaren, mm. who said, wow, that guy's got a great look. He should front a band. And I was like, never really sang. Um, but come on, audition. And I was like, no, 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 I don't think so. I'll leave it for a while. Then this guy who I'd met a couple of times, um, at the end of the day, he was a bit more of a blagger than, than what he was delivering. Um, I auditioned and with Chrissy Hind from the Pretenders. Pretenders, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we only did a photo shoot and we put black bin liners on our head, thankfully. Because I didn't know. Is this the Moors murderers? I, yeah. yeah, I didn't know. My age, I wouldn't have had a clue who the Moors murderers were. Mm -hmm. Chrissy Hind being America. She wouldn't have had a, a hope in hell of knowing who th they were. 
So after we did this shoot, this guy, I can't name him, but he conjures up the story that we'd recorded a song yeah. about <laughs> Free Hendley. <laughs> so then it hits the tabloids, and we are even more like of an outcast than the Sex Pistols. <laughs> and me and Chrissy are like, what the fuck? Why have you oh you've stitched us up? What a, what a, and I'm just like, well, we've got, we've got bin liners on. Nobody <laughs> knows it's us. <laughs> but PP, word had spread around the club scene, yeah. and bouncers really wanted to kick mine and Chrissy's head in. And it was just like, we're not involved, we're not. So then me and Chrissy started working together and Chrissy loved my lyrics and she loved the way I sang. And she said, no, I want you to sing. I said, but I love your voice. So she said, no, but I like your lyrics and I, I think, you know, you, you, with your image, you know, you should, you should front the band. <laughs> so we rehearsed for a while. Well, that's the echo of punk, isn't it? But anyone can be famous. The image is first and then the music comes second, right? Well, what happened was when me and Chrissy were rehearsing, um, a guy called Andrew Travosky, who played, who was very uh, an important name yeah. in punk rock, he had the Roxy, and then he opened the Vortex. Later, the Fridge. Many years, many years later, in, in Brixton. Brixton. Yeah, um, I live opposite that. I used to. Mm. Uh, well, he was responsible for getting me into a band, um, asking me to audition for a band called the Photons which was a bit similar to what Glenn and Midge and Rusty were doing with the Rich Kids. It was power pop. But to be quite honest, the only thing about the Rich Kids, uh, about the, the Photons, um, that was anything of interest that... Um, photons means rays of light. Yeah. So the rays of light were the different colour suits the band members had to wear. Like oh, a prism. Okay, yeah. <coughs> and it became like a uniform to me. Mm. And we were doing this like mini UK tour. And by the time we got to London, I'd got bored of wearing two different colour <laughs> suits. And I had five days before the London. And I knew in the London show, it was going to be like the who's who of punk. I knew yeah. like the slits, the clash, Susie and the Banshees, the Pistols, Midge. All your sort of idols. Everybody and, yeah. was going to be there. So I'd s spoken to uh, Glenn Matlock's girlfriend, Celia, and we'd come up and we um, designed this sort of, it was like this jumper, but it had sort of all like raggedy bits and ruffles hanging off it in <laughs> different colours. And then these skin tight trousers with slashes, but with different colours plastic in them Ooh, okay. in quite provocative places <laughs> but the the plastic had on the bum it had zips nice okay and the, bar, <laughs> the zips were left undone and then there'd be perspex <coughs> perspex um, like so you could see through the perspex oh yeah, yeah. yeah. um oh. did that get hot <laughs> <laughs> your pictures of, your pictures of this right or um i'm sure so there are, i'm yeah, sure yeah. there are pictures well, but i mean you, i Facebook. actually went into the bathroom not not one member of the band knew anything about this <laughs> and uh i went into the bathroom literally after sound check and changed Change. did, actually didn't take I, I i took the red suit in and, and a carrier bag mm -hmm and left the, ca the red suit on the door, put this perspex, tr the, the trousers with the perspex and the ruffled like top on, and they were banging on the door, come on, come on, we're on stage, the, 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 the curtains are about to open, the cur and as I walked out, I could see their faces, it was like, what's he got on? <laughs> and well, it was too late, they couldn't do anything. And anyway, we started the numbers that we'd been playing all around, and Afterwards, people were coming up saying, yeah, that was brilliant. And um, one of the people that came up was Midge and said, I've got some free studio time at the EMI, st the official EMI studios. Sure. Um, I think you've got a great, you know, um, vocal mm. um, appeal and which a vocal that can be worked on. Yeah. Why don't you come in and use this? Um, this is pre-Ultravox, right, Midge? Oh, He's really? Yeah. Like long before. Yeah. Midge was in Ultravox. Um, so what we did was we um, did a track called In the Year 2525, All the King's Horses, All the King's Men, mm -hmm. our first ever single, Tar. And the, then, <coughs> at the time, we'd also found 
um, our first ever club, which was called Billy's. And Billy's, um, through like Susie Sue, Philip Salon, um, George O'Dowd, who, who as he was then known, then became Boy George. And also like um, another contingent of people who had got very despondent with mm. the whole punk thing right. and were looking for something new. So Boy George and, and those guys were looking to be in some sort of band. This is pre-Billets, right? No, 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 no. They were just wanting to be in... The uh, scene. They're just wanting to be away from punk into okay, something okay. new. Sure. And we were playing what we'd recorded with Midge. Mm-hmm. We were playing stuff that I'd picked up on tour with the Sex Pistols in France, like Lizzie Mercedes Clark, Nina Hagen, Rusty had been in Berlin and picked up trucks by Kraftwerk and Eno mm-hmm. and a few other people. So the electronic part was th- that side of it coming in, right? Yeah, so we were playing, we were mixing in Visage as like really... An experiment? Uh, more like floor fillers. Sure. To, to actually, because um, we were still, we were um, playing Bowie, we were playing Ferry, we were playing Ballroom Blitz. We were playing mm-hmm. Bolan. Yeah, this is Billy's on Dean Street in Soho, right? This is yeah. Billy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, obviously, because um, I decided I was going to become the door whore and had a cane, and I just didn't want people coming in who were sort of going to glare and sort of gawp at the way some of these creative characters had thought about what they were going to be turning out as for the evening. Yeah. Well, if in that time, I guess, going to the club, Billy's, or even the Blitz was dangerous, right? Because you could get beaten up by a gang of people just from wearing makeup, lipstick, high heels, if you were a man, right? Well, it, was, it wasn't that. It was, to be quite honest, Billy's, um, unbeknownst to us, was, it was like, um, it was, the guy who owned it was a pimp. And <laughs> a lot of his girls used to come in there to keep <laughs> out the warm, yeah. to keep warm oh, okay. from the cold. So then we got a lot of the clients coming in as well, and they were like tapping on to our to the girls who were very scantily cladly dressed. <coughs> right. But the ones that weren't connected to the pimp. <laughs> that were our so clients. You, okay, right, so your okay. guys. And treating yeah, them like... Okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> And uh. so after a while, it was, it wasn't, um, it wasn't such a large premises as the Blitz, but yeah. it was the whole thing about these um, characters, if you will, just characters of the night, t- um, <coughs> c- clicking onto the girls, mm. yeah. and it was making it a bit more seedy than what yeah. it was was, and also I wanted the girls. How you know they might have been dressed like Edwardian hookers, or yeah. you know they might have been dressed in bustiers and yeah. and um, sort of like bodices and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. you know. Um, but I wanted them to feel safe and comfortable, in you and know com- how yeah, they like chose to express it themselves. It was their own place. Yeah, and that was the whole reason of being so strict on the door was that I didn't want everybody to be gawked at. Mm. I wanted <laughs> them to be able to express themselves. The yeah, your, your door poly is it policy is legendary, isn't it? Boy George, uh, <laughs> to quote, <laughs> called you a fucking monster. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, the thing, um, the thing about um, worried about the boy, um, when Mark <coughs> played me, uh, Mark, Mark Warren, Mark Warren played yeah. me, and I was never... Um, oh, a git. No, no, and I never touched anybody's asses up to say, oh, yeah, well, that's a nice arse, you can go in. Mm. Um, and also, the way that Mark looked in the film, I was only 17 when I was yeah. doing that. Yeah, he's Mark. like a 35-year-old guy. Uh, for those listening or watching, Worried About the Boy was a 2010, I guess, BBC biopic with uh, Douglas Booth playing George and uh, Mark Warren, one of our famous character actors, playing uh, he Steve was, here. Um, he was great, but I mean... The way that they put so much makeup on him, and, right. and as you said, he was 35 playing a 17-year-old yeah. boy, <laughs> and the white pan- pancake makeup, he most probably looks as old as I look now. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, although his portrayal was quite good, apart from the fact there were some things that George had told him you know, to put in, 
And then George actually, after a while, I, um, it was just before my autobiography came out, said, really, I don't have any qualms with Steve. Yeah. I really like Steve. Hmm. It's just that I was pissed off that he became <laughs> famous before me. <laughs> and every time I hear Fade to Grey on the radio, I'd want to fucking okay. turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the Blitz, I mean, what the Blitz did, it actually, um, because of me being like the strictest door whore in London and having a cane and holding a mirror up. Yes. Mm. Um, one of the most famous stories is uh, somebody would turn up... In oh, I read this today, yeah. ...in a wetsuit <laughs> and flippers. And the, pa- the, face, the face painted half black, half white. And I pulled out this compact and said, <laughs> you look ridiculous. Where do you think you're going? And he said, in your club. And I said, no, you're not. You're going to the Thames. You're going, if you're going anywhere in a suit like that, the Thames is that way. The Would guy, you let you in? I think the guy really wanted to like, just be shriveled up. And I said, go home and try a bit harder. And maybe next week you might get in. And for a while, got a bit of a kick out yeah. of like idiotic people. Yeah. Like, there's no way that they were going to get in. But so wait, the Blitz happened after Billy's? You left Billy's yeah. and moved to the Blitz? Well, yeah. you we went to we Bill- left, yeah, yeah, we had to because Billy's was smaller and we needed a bigger premises. And so you started the Blitz yourselves? Well, of course, his clientele, yeah. of course, was a, yeah. in slight danger from all these Johns that yeah, were hitting yeah, yeah. on the girls thinking they were hookers oh, when they just, went. Yeah, yeah. Date, so, and also the people that owned the Blitz mm. were really um, of the same sort of frame of mind as us. Right. They wanted me to actually say to their members, yeah. no, sorry, this is closed tonight, it's a private party. Right, okay. So I could have carte blanche and say to whoever I wanted right. that, no, this club is a private mm-hmm. club yeah. and it's up to me who comes in and who doesn't. Yeah, okay. um, and we did get a couple of warnings from fire brigades mm-hmm. Were you the first of that generation that was an independent promoter, whereas before the establishment would have their own people mm. on the door? And then you guys, you, but this was the first, I guess, wave of that independent people coming in and calling the shots, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, in all honesty, it's day, I mean, it quite... It's still around now. I mean, I, it, I did it for three years at uh, uh, Maddox in the West End. Yeah, I mean, it's, day, it's more or less... It wasn't as good as you, I might add. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I, I, I've seen something tonight. Somebody in, has invited... It sounds, sounds disgusting. It's yeah, called Carpet it. Burns. Have you heard of that? Uh, well, I've had Carpet Burns <laughs> in my time. Was this a band or a, a, a No, it's a, a night. night. It's a night. Yeah. And somebody's invited me there. I, I don't know when. It's, a, it's something that's come up on my phone saying... You, uh, it's, a, it's a well-known night, and it's run exactly the same way by... Obviously, in this day and age, they don't do it with flyers. They do it with social media networks right. mm. such as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. They don't do it like or invitations and things like that. But I mean, to be quite honest, there were flyers for Billy's. There were flyers for the Blitz. But word of mouth spread so quickly. Mm. And when um, we had warnings from the fire brigade... Like we, we were like well over our numbers, mm-hmm. and this was like the second warning. If mm. you get the third warning, they shut you down. They're shutting us down, yeah. but it's not just shutting the night down. They shut the whole. They shut the whole club down. Yeah. So the the owner who was on our side, the manager who was. What was on the our sorry? Side, the fire fire brigade's issue with you? Too many people. Too, Too many, many people. people. Okay. So the owner who was on our side, the manager that was on our side. The waitresses who love working there, yeah. the bar staff that love working there, were all going to be out of a job. Yeah. And it was going to be a venue that we love working at that yeah. wasn't going to be ours anymore. Yeah. So the night that Mick Jagger shows up, absolutely ah. paralytic. Yeah. And he's like, and don't, I you know Mick Jagger. don't you know who I am? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> of course I know who you are. Is your name Steve? <laughs> and um, it's like, I caught the eye of one of his entourage. And it was a, a really lucky, it was a friend of mine, Sabrina Guinness, from the mm. Guinness heiress. Mm, mm. And I said to Sabrina, I said, Sabrina, can you come here, please? And she, come, she said, I said, look, I cannot let any of you in. I said, see them people over there? And she looked over her shoulder. I said, 
if any more people come up, the reason that queue is right around the block is there's already nearly 300 people in there. So it's one in one. If I let like six more in now, they're going to just rush over here. Shut you down. All the things down. And it's going to be like, everyone's going to be out of a job. And it's not just going to be the end of the blitz one night. The club and everybody's going to be out of a job. So she whispered to him and he was... Like shouting some out. I remember you and all of this. <laughs> I remember you, Steve uh, Strange. And it was like <laughs> the next day it was in I think it even made news at ten. <laughs> and it was on the front of the sun, <laughs> on the front of the mirror. Was it to do with the way he was dressed as well? Because that's the legend, isn't it? He wasn't doesn't uh, look good enough. It or? wasn't that it no. wasn't that at all. It was literally of course I numbers. knew that he was. Yeah. It was numbers. Um but um that just broke everything then, didn't it? It just everyone It went knew. absolutely, completely <laughs> Hughes were Stratospheric. right around the block. I mean, we needed a bigger venue. So we did. We found a bigger venue. We opened the Blitz and we opened Hell. <laughs> Hell was on a Thursday night, which <laughs> it's quite funny because Hell was in, a ch- in, in an old church. And then when it got to the full, we opened the back doors and, and it actually emptied out into a graveyard. <laughs> when there's no more room in hell, <laughs> go to go the into the graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, you know, I, what we were trying to do as well is, I think we knew that the Blitz was sort of in, being latched upon by the media. Mm. Um, for you were trying wh- to dissipate that a bit, maybe, yeah. Yeah, and uh, um, because they were coming up with names, they're like the Futurists, right. the Blitz Kids, Blitz kids the yeah. Cult with No Name, right. um, then the New Romantics. We decided then that Hell was closing, Blitz was closing. We found another place. We found mm. um, a place in Baker Street, and we called it Club for Heroes. Okay, and it helped. So it helped. It held 750 people. Oh, wow. And on the opening night, Paul McCartney rang me up and said, well, I look after Michael Jackson. So I had to go and meet Michael Jackson. I was off my face on coke. (laughs) And I was completely trolleyed off my face. And I was, I suppose in some way, I was a bit disrespectful to Michael Jackson. But I did look after him, but it was like looking after... When was this, the opening night? About 19... (laughs) Mm, it must have been about 1979, 80, 80, 80, 81, I think. Was Lennon still around at that point? Or had Lennon just been shot? Was I'm not sh- no, now you're getting shot too in 81, comfy. didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> I don't John know. John Lennon. Um, <coughs> so yeah, you met him. And I yeah. met him, yeah. and, but it was really like looking after a 12-year-old boy. Um, and he had, a, he had a man with him, and everyone that was in my entourage thought that it must have been his grandfather <laughs> but it wasn't it was his bodyguard ah. oh, wow. and uh where we met because um paul mccartney was doing ebony and ivory I- ebony and ivory with him um and he, um one of linda mccartney's daughter heather was in sort of my sort of posse of friends so paul said look michael wants to see what's going on in your new club club mm. for heroes so when we got him in there, he was just like, oh my God, look at these people. They are so amazing. <laughs> and he, he was just like, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to just put him in the VIP room now and hopefully somebody's going to like look after him for a while. <laughs> and I put him on a table. I think I put him on a table with Phil Linnett, the wrong person to put him on a table with. <laughs> Phil Linnett, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll. Yeah. No, you don't mix with Michael Jackson with Thin Lizzy. <laughs> But, um, Unless you're hanging out with Steve Strange. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I remember that like Michael Jackson said to me, where's the dance floor? And it was getting quite you know, late mm. for, for Michael Jackson. Michael, I think Michael Jackson had a curfew <laughs> at really? one o'clock. Really? <laughs> All the way through his career? I don't know. Oh, Maybe okay. it was Certainly his when he was, y- when, yeah, he was yeah. when he was at Club Here, it's definitely the really? curfew. Well, this is yeah. pre-thriller, and uh, isn't it? He's still in the Jackson Five, right? Okay. No, 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 no. Was it no. off? Oh, no, off the wall. Off the Billie wall. Billy Jean and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, and Ebony and Ivory. Yeah. So he went onto the dance floor and literally just cleared the dance floor. <laughs> and I remember, why is everybody leaving the dance floor? So I had to go and have a see what was going on. 
And by this time as well, because of like what has gone on, the fate of Grey had gone to number one in 13 countries, right. I wasn't able to be as strong on the door. So I'd actually moulded. Hmm. I think maybe for a while was my boyfriend or my flatmate, the girl Mandy. It might have been Rosemary. I, one of three people that I'd moulded to do the door because we were actually also being picked to open uh, another bigger venue oh, wow. for two and a half thousand people. Wow. wow. And um, anyway, this night I'd found out why the floor was cleared. It was because my, Michael Jackson literally gone on the floor, cleared the dance floor, and then he was in his element, and um, that was him, me and him, waving goodbye and had a great night. <laughs> I mean, there was other times in there with Pete Townsend and... Um, I don't know if you know, remember Ron, Ronnie, um, uh, Brian Ferry was there, yeah. Um, yeah. Jack Nicholson, uh, but also, but then when we opened the Camden Palace, which was the original, the music cool. machine. Okay. Um, I guess this was like the London version of Studio 54 of sorts then, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, people said... Did uh, you go there ever? No, I, I actually, when I um, went to New York um, uh, to uh, to launched the first Visage album, I mm. said to the record company, Andy Warhol's going to be there with Debbie Harry, David Byrne, and various members like Nona Hendrix, um, other people, and Blonde, you know, Debbie... Um, Debbie Harry, Blondie. Debbie Harry. Yeah. Um, and I said, I have to make an entrance. I want an elephant to, 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 <laughs> to, to take me down Fifth Avenue. So they said, an elephant? I said, yeah, I want an elephant. I said, it's going to do the thing. It'll do the trick. Yeah. I said, it will definitely do the trick. We'll, have, we'll, be, on, we'll be on coast to coast, yeah. t TV in the morning. Cement Visage's name into the American public's mind. Yeah, but it did the wrong thing, right? Because they <laughs> rang me and they said, we can't get an elephant. We can only get a camel. And I, I threw like a big hissy fit. Said, That's not good enough. <laughs> Diva. And it was like the only thing more drugged up than me, the camel, because <laughs> the camel had to be drugged like to walk down Fifth Avenue to it's get so him busy, out of yeah. the out of the the camp not the camp they don't call them a camel. It's like a horse's box for a, yeah, for a yeah. camel. And I remember all the pictures <laughs> of me arriving at this part <laughs> and Andy Warhol like trying to greet me as I'm getting <laughs> off this ungraced gracefully getting off this ca camel <laughs> this hump camel's hump um, but yeah it did the trick it did it it really did and every um, part like even in Boston we had an entrance like we had <laughs> Al Capone's Al, Al Capone's glass uh, f famous glass oh. like car for the you know Al yeah. Capone gang to, to arrive there in, yeah, yeah. in San Francisco. Wow. I think in San Francisco. I and what are you coasting on at this point? This is the second single, which is Fade to Grey, right? That's what's happening now. Because Tar is the first one, right? No, Tar, um, Fade to Grey went to number one in 13 countries. But I'm saying we're at this point now. It was Fade to Grey the big. Uh, yeah, 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 time. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So we're promoting the first album. Yeah. Um, so, right, that was for New York, The Camel. Al Capone for Chicago. I think um, either LA or San Francisco, it was like um, a horse drawn carriages with cowboys. <laughs> there was a theme more or less to the seven events of where we, um, and it wasn't just um, like the launch of the album. I think like in New York and definitely in LA, um, the models were sort of wearing designers I was pioneering oh, right. and they were actually wearing the clothes I mean some of it I think you've seen yeah um, we did that for the second album in Paris um, my throat's going a bit um, uh, yeah that's on your DVD the 2005 visage CD which is the uh, I guess the French catwalk show right that you're kind of running uh, yeah I yeah. did the whole thing for that which is what I did for the um and some of the models you picked uh, quite went on to bigger things and it came in of course was famous for the uh Levi's, Levi's and, and, and there was Monty the girl yeah. who was known to be my girlfriend at the time and was for quite some time uh the beautiful blonde who wore the Anthony Price famous dress 
And if you look very closely, Stephen Jones, who makes all my hats. And if you look even closer, doing dressing um, the Melissa Kaplan collection, mm -hmm. was Sade. Mm -hmm. Long before yes, Smooth Operator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was long before Smooth Operator. Wow. Wow. Some of the clothes in the Fade to Grey video, uh, were they your designs or someone you were working with? Cause no, they were Melissa Kaplan. Because Philip I just was mentioned. the Milner who did the hats, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Is that Philip Milner? Is it? No, he was Stephen. Milner. Stephen. Stephen, sorry, was the Milner, the hat maker, that did the hats in the Fade to Grey and stuff. Yeah, Stephen. I don't defect. I mean, I, Stephen was an original sort of blitz person. Mm. Right. He's still uh, making hats though as well, isn't he? I assume. He's an o OBE, he makes yeah, all yeah, my hats. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's brilliant. He's, he's made all the hats on the covers. Um, and he must be the most well-known Milner in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say by... I was going to say, oh, the amazing makeup, who did that? Because that was like, that's kind of, I guess that's like the iconic face of the new romantic movement, that you in that Fade to Grey video. The, if you see the new album, mm. Hearts and Knives, it's Just got here. the Fade to Grey cover yeah. split in two. Yeah. Um, Lara Hempelman, who I plicked, picked, because um, I do fa I do lectures in, I'm a solvent, I, in, um, I'm a fellow dean in the Solvent Uni with Andrew Marchant, and I do lectures on music, style, makeup. There was one girl's makeup I saw on the wall, and I went, wow, that girl, who is she? And they went, oh, she just left us. And I went, can I find her? <laughs> and they went, why? I said, well, I'm really interested. In, and I'm very picky about who I work with makeup. When I go to a TV show, they all want to get me in the chair. And, like, and I'm like, no, 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 no. I said, OK, even if I do a TV show, I'll do my own makeup. Mm. Yeah. Um, but if it's something like re recent, like for instance, the Bowie thing at the v &A, sure. and I was supposed <coughs> to do the red carpet for London tonight, Lara did my makeup for that. Um, she's amazing. She's like, and I was so pleased that I actually did a lecture at Solvent Uni in, 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 in Portsmouth mm -hmm. and found her. Um, since that cover, she is now unobtainable <laughs> even for me <laughs> Laura where are you <laughs> but I do have a backup a person who is really amazing as well I have a sponsor Sh um, Shiomura I don't know if uh, you've yeah, heard yeah, of them yeah. Japanese Make yeah, makeup makeup yeah. Um, Max who used to be with them um, I did an audition for the BBC just recently and the night before I'd come down with a really really high temperature and I thought I was going to have to pull out of the audition mm. and um, I said to them at the BBC if I don't have a makeup artist I don't think I'm going to be able to do it tomorrow mm. and they said to me well we haven't got we've got our own makeup artist and I went no no I don't <laughs> no no this has to be somebody that's going to save the day <laughs> so I rang Max I said Max can you come and help and he literally came to the hotel and all of you know like I, under the light you expect to be hot sure. yeah. and I was like sweating like, like I don't know like Fever. a whore in a brothel <laughs> yeah uh, but my face was even with a hat yeah I mean my face was just staying intact pristine and yeah. I'm looking at Max thinking help me I'm, I'm like feeling soaking wet but yeah. why and he's going no you're fine you're fine you're fine <laughs> I'm going don't you need to make like don't you need to powder me? no you're fine you're fine and I'm like burning up and burning up and thinking and also I'm getting really emotional because they're showing like footage and it was a sort of um, a thing um, I can't really say too much but oh, it was okay. like um, it was like too cool for school and it was like kids of today and they had to qu they had to quiz me and oh, then wow, okay. I had to reverse psychology yeah and I can't tell you the outcome okay. <laughs> but it was for me anyway it was great because yeah. I was a bit thought I thought oh mm, I'll, I'll know a lot about the 80s but won't do very well but it, 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 anyway <laughs> it went good for me yeah. when you're in New York had you left is the there any more of that water <coughs> which kind of water yes I can get you some water <laughs> hang on I was going to say uh, if you just tell the audience while well, I'm just getting you some water naughty water uh, the Bowie thing when he walked into the Blitz uh, what happened with that? Because was this Another when you've legend. been to New York? You've come back from New York because he comes in for styling tips and to cast you in his uh, Ashes to Ashes video, famously. 
It was. Um, it was literally just before um, we'd gone to New York, mm. um, and I'd noticed. This is after the Mick Jagger incident. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, I noticed this limousine had circled the queue that, <laughs> um, or the building. The Blitz is. We hadn't moved to Hell. Mm. We hadn't moved to um, Club for Heroes. It right. was still the Blitz. Okay. And I noticed that um, the Blitz, um, sorry, this limo had gone round two times. The third time, this f French woman, she came out to me and very arrogantly she said, I need to talk to you very, very, very <laughs> important to you. Yeah. So I said, I'm working. She said, it's very important that I talk to you now. So she'd put me to the one side and I said to the people there, you cannot go in now. You have to just wait there till I speak to this lady. She said, I have somebody in the car, very important. I said, they have to be more important than the people. These people have been waiting here a long time. She said, I think that I, I think he is more important. It's David Bowie. And I'm like, who? She said, David Bowie. And I went, oh, and I felt like, going, oh, fuck. <laughs> and I just thought, what am I going to do? Like, because if anybody knows in yeah. the club that he's there, yeah. it's just going to be a riot. Yeah. And the Blitz, when you go through the front door, past me, you go down to the down floor, the DJ's there, Boy George is at the back taking your coat. <laughs> the dance floor's here. I think that's so Then insane. here, you've got like a stairs which goes upstairs and you can overlook the downstairs dance floor from upstairs. And I'm thinking, what do I do? I'm going to move security to the bottom of the stairs and get him up the back fire escape. So, is no this pre sorry, intro is this pre New York? Yeah, pre New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we went through that when you went off to get that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I thought, right, the only way we can get him in without everybody knowing is up the fire escape. But what I didn't actually come to realise, well, I did, but I didn't. It, it didn't actually register straight away was that everyone in the queue that later got in knew knew, knew <laughs> that he'd gone David so the whistle had gone in. <laughs> so although there was security downstairs stopping mm. people going upstairs mm. what word had spread like wildfire mm. that bowie was upstairs and people were like trying to clamor over the security <laughs> people were like trying to like uh, hoist each other up <laughs> and climb up <laughs> Uh, and then this arrogant French woman, whose name was Coco. Yeah. Does she know? She came down and she said, David wants you on the table upstairs. And I was like, I'm working. <laughs> um, at the moment, I, I, the, this door, these people, the door doesn't close till one o'clock. Yeah. It's now about half past 12, 20 to one. At one o'clock, I can come up. At one, at one, I went up there and he said, um, I've been watching you for some time. And I think you've got the most incredible movement going on. Uh, he said, would you uh, be interested in, would you be in my video? And you said no. And I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> this is surreal. Like one of my <laughs> idols asking me to be in a video. And um, he said, um, there's a thing about, there's a thing though. He said, um, I want you to style it and I want you to pick the extras and meet at the Hilton Hotel. And there's one thing that's wrong. He said, it's tomorrow morning at 6.30. Whoa. So I'm thinking, and he goes, oh, you will be paid. And I'm like, oh my God, Dave Bowie's asking me to be in a video. Do it for free. I'm picking the ass. I'm actually picking the extras. I'm picking all the clothes. And then he said to me, and by the way, who does your makeup? And I'm like, do I let him know this or not? You lose them forever. I mean, it's like my yeah. secret weapon. Yeah. Like Lara, Lara Himpleman, who yeah. did that. She's yeah. like my secret weapon. When I lost Richard Chara, and I mean, Richard Chara, he did the Fade to Grey cover. Right. Um, he also did m uh, the very iconic image of the snake and the eyebrow. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, really thing. Um, he also did all the makeup in the Fate of Grey video, which won video of the year. Um, then when, he, when Richard did the makeup, um, the thing about my makeup on the day, you don't really get to see my makeup on the day, mm -hmm. which is very similar to Bowie's, mm -hmm. because 
I've got a bloody hat on, which has got a bigger veil on it, so you can't see what makeup I'm wearing at all. But my makeup and the eyebrow was exactly the same as David's. Yeah. Um, and the thing was, the fade to grey video had been shot, um, but come out basically a little bit after Mm-hmm. Ashes to ashes. So I got really pissed off when people were saying, you copied "Oh, Bowie. Steve's yeah. copied Bowie," <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm, "Well, no, you not really. Bowie, yeah. I styled it. I chose the extras. I chose the clothes. Yeah. I even lent him my makeup artist." Yeah. And um, then I started to say, which is true, and he didn't mind that he's a very clever magpie, <laughs> and which is true. I mean, you know, he he. Um, all right, he, he did um, Lou Reed, um, and he also did The Passenger with Iggy Pop. Sure. Right, but right. it's it sort of is like, it comes into these sort of like movements. Then he got into the punk movement with the Banshees. Sure. And he also then got in to sort of the craft work thing mm. and um, what was, you know, with Lowe, and Brian Eno and sure. stuff like that. He admits as well that he he zones in to sort of underground type youth things mm. and is a, is a sort of a magpie for mm. these ideas. How was he as a man to work with? Did you even have time to spend time with him on the set? Was he just an in out quick do it on the day? No, no, no. Yeah. We had an intimate kiss. And we uh, I, I I had an open door to his trailer. I suppose because my makeup artist was in there as well, so yeah, no, he was very, very cool to work with. Very cool to well, work. Well, famously with. as well, you thought you were going to get whisked off to some exotic locale because it was David Bowie, and lo and behold, what happened? No, it was yeah because <laughs> no, it wasn't basically because it was David Bowie. Yeah. It was because of where the hotel, where we were told to to meet. Yeah. Right. At six thirty in the morning. So we thought, 6.30 in the morning, outside the Hilton Hotel, we've got to be going somewhere Off like to Heathrow. exotic to Heathrow. Yeah. I'm getting on a plane yeah. somewhere nice. But I, I keep saying it wrong, and I still don't know that if it's right. But it's not South End, it's another beach. <laughs> <laughs> but the beach was actually cordoned off, and it was oh, a yeah. private beach yeah. for the day, but it wasn't South End, mm. it was... Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. Somebody will have to research which beach it was. But um, David, the video, uh, not David Bowie, mm. oh, the producer, listen, I've now got, um, I've got a name blank, um, very famous producer. Mick Rock? Or no, he's the photographer that directs some of David Bowie videos, isn't he? No, he's no, he doesn't do the video. He d- just does a lot of the pho- the Photos. photography. Yeah. Okay. Um. Um. The f- anyway, h- the video director, the bulldozer scene mm. wasn't actually going to be used at all until the producer said, "Why don't we make use of that bulldozer?" Mm. And I was so pleased that he said, "Why don't we have the bulldozer pushing everybody up the beach?" Because I had this ecclesiastical dress robe on, the priest robe, (laughs) and everybody was wearing long, flowing ecclesiastical robes. Stephen Jones had gear. Mine was like a black beehive. (laughs) Oh, the other guy's Stephen Jones. That's amazing. I didn't know that. I always wondered who the other three people were. No, no, no. Stephen Jones, the hat maker. Yes, I thought you brought him along to be in the video as well. No, oh, no, no just the, the hat. Pe- the headpiece. Keep up, Ethan. Come <laughs> on, son. Come on. Um, <laughs> so, <tonight>. <laughs> um, um, it was great because um, we were all falling all over the place, walking in the sand in these bloody long dresses. Mm. So, once the bulldozer's pushing us along, it's great because we've got like an opportunity to be caught by the bulldozer. Oh, instead yeah, of, like, of course. Going all over the place. And I do this movement, which goes like that, right? And it's a simple thing, but I do it just so I don't look ridiculous when I'm falling over. Then, the next video that comes out is fashion. <laughs> and what does David Bowie do? He does that on the stage. Fashion. <laughs> to to the exactly left. the same move. Huh. He copied you. Magpie, yeah. magpie David, magpie. <laughs> so how long does Visage go after this? I'm assuming that helps push your... Uh, band and stuff and things. Uh, 
How long does Visage it lasts up to 1985? Doesn't he have two hit albums and a bunch of singles? We had three albums. We had eight. Um, was it seven? Top tens. Seven top. Seven top twenties. Eight <laughs> top thirty with the top thirty. Um, yeah, it went. Actually, our biggest markets were not England. It was Germany, Japan, mm. Australia. Not really massive in America, but massive in America. Um, we were I had. Well, that's real loud racket. <laughs> and that's not my. That's listeners. not my empty booze bottles, by <laughs> the way. <laughs> Um, probably they won't that's what he left think, outside, it's listeners. Too, it's too far away. It has to be close. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, uh, a, having a cult following in America, it's like most probably your record sales here. Like, for instance, record sales in Germany mm. for a gold disc in Germany is 500,000. Because I remember seeing a gold disc in Germany and saying to my, my German record label, how many do you have to get for one of them? She said 500,000. Mm, we'll never have one of them. <laughs> and then I remember doing a picture armed with about eight of them. <laughs> and then in uh, England, for gold, you only have to sell 100,000 for gold. Oh, wow. So in America, although you've got cult yeah. underground following, yeah. I bet this is coast to coast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you're talking about Boston, Chicago. Right all over like LA, New, New York, York, Miami, San Diego, Miami. You, you on, you, but you're still talking about selling about 500,000 al you know, albums. Mm. Mm. But I mean, if you go global in New York, but v unfortunately, <coughs> it's only now that the present lineup, I, when we recorded this album 25 years later, yeah. mm. um, amazingly, critically acclaimed by Rolling Stone, critically mm. acclaimed by virtually Tom, Dick and Harry. I think it yeah, really is. No, I mean, this is, uh, I, I think I read some of these, used uh, the synths are not past 1984, 1985, is that right? Yeah, everything, Original there's synth, nothing yeah. on there. It um, really does. It also, no, it did, not only doesn't, it's, it sounds classic, but also modern, I think, in many ways, it's better than the old stuff in some ways. It really is, like, I... Do you know... I started um, listening to this, thought, oh, let's see if they can pull this off. And I was like, oh my God, it's... It's amazing. It's really fantastic. Thank you. But so many people have said it, and I can honestly say, um, Universal on this is brought out on an independent label, right. especially like a lot of other people, like Erasure, Alison okay. Moye have done. Yeah. Um, even Texas, I think, did the same. Oh, that, yeah. that might not be true, but definitely yeah. Alison Moye, definitely Erasure. We brought it out on an independent label, and and, and then Universal sniffing around released around the best of Visage. Oh, really? Oh. But you can get on iTunes. The link is on the website. But they put um, um, a poster of me, and in the poster they had that in the corner, and I'm thinking, Universal never do anything like this. But then you turn it over and they give it five out of five. Oh, wow. Like a glowing review. It wow. really is. And then I'm thinking, why are they doing that? And obviously it's because it's promoting the back catalogue. Right, though. yeah, yeah. Uh. It really is, uh -huh. though. I mean, uh, what was the impetus behind... Because this is Visage Mark Three, right? Uh, Visage One, I guess, stopped in 85. Visage um, Two went a bit Pete Tong. It was Midge, me, Rusty, and Midge was like, uh, <laughs> all I can say is me and Midge have a love-hate relationship. I still think the world of Midge, and I still thank Midge for seeing me at that Photons gig. Never had, would never have a bad word to say about him. Sure. Um, unlike me and Rusty, now have a love-hate relationship. He hates me with a vengeance, but I don't let, I, that is, you know, neither there nor here. Sure. Well, you don't but have to talk about it on the air. I mean, we spoke on the phone, I guess, a couple of days ago, and you didn't really say anything bad about Rusty. I just think it's such a shame that two literally iconic people that have, like... But so many people have tried to tell him this, and it is yeah. a shame. And, I mean, it's about time that he stopped doing things on Facebook, and because all he's doing is... Um, Unfortunately, I can't help it that people see me as the face of Visage. Mm. Um, I mean, I was the one. Well, you literally, I said that at the, at the start. You, that, that Visage album cover is like one of the most things. Well, it's burned into my psyche. But, you know, I wanted 
to tour with Visage yeah. as the first liner, mm -hmm. but yeah. I could they couldn't because this is Visage Mark II, right? And this no, is no, no, Visage Mark Mark the first Mark album. Mark. Don't forget then um, we're working with Billy Curry. Midge and Billy are working in a studio on Visage stuff. Um, John Fox has left Ultra Fox. Sure. Midge likes working with no. Billy likes working with Midge and says, "Look, we're left without a singer. Can you think? Why don't you think about joining Ultra Fox?" So not only has Midge got the double whammy with a, a massive hit with Visage, yeah. he's then been asked to join Ultra Fox and get to Vienna. So then um, we also um, Barry Adamson from Magazine. Dave Formula from Magazine, Magazine were touring, John McGee from Susie and the Banshees were touring. Sure. I'm the only member that can get up and actually promote. Sure. So uh, it's really frustrating for me because I want to go out and play live right. and I can't. All mm. I can go and do is live TV. Everyone has too many projects, yeah. Much too many projects. Yeah. And on the second album of recording, I was like saying, well, I think I want things to be different on this album I don't want to stick to the winning formula so this is when me and Rusty started to think that we wanted to go move off into a more of like Pleasure Boys and the Anvil which was a much more rock feel sure and by the third album Beat Boy we'd gone completely sort of more on sort of, sort of the U2 electronic feel yeah sure which then they'd actually adopted with their oh I can't remember the name of it but they'd gone from the original U2 sound right. to like electronic sure. um, and again um, although it was um, Rusty um, Steve Barnacle who's on this album yeah he's the bass guitarist right bass bass, guitar? yep. he's one of the best bass, bass players going actually um, he's from a very musical family his brother Gary played sax on the first um, he played sax on Night Train that's Gary Barnacle. Pete Barnacle played on a sub a sub band after Visage that I put together called Strange Cruise. Mm. But the reason um, the the musicians Robin Simon, who plays the most amazing guitar um, on this album from Ultra Fox, um, or the original Ultra Fox, I put this band together so we could go live. And actually, we've beat the critics. The critics have actually said, you know, we've, we can actually hold our hands up yeah. and say, you know, this Visage album. Oh, it's legit, totally. It's brilliant. Because I'm sure they were all kind of ready to get the <coughs> knives out a little bit. Well, I, you as, know, as people are, when, you know, when people bring it out and out back, yeah know? exactly i was waiting exactly <laughs> i was waiting for a bad review yeah. i think you were slightly casting a bad light in that documentary from 2005 whatever happened to the gender benders when they were you were trying to restart visage again i think around that time <clears throat> and uh i don't know i think the way it was edited or put together they just i'm not sure if they you, they were trying to make you look bad or not but uh when i heard this was coming out i just thought oh here we go and then it was a different lineup. E these weren't the people in the visage that you were re recording with in that in, in that documentary. I wasn't recording in 2005. You weren't. What no. was that stuff in that documentary thing? You went I to think do a, maybe a, a German TV show, didn't you? I think maybe I was doing the Here and Now tours. Oh yes, okay. Um, because mm. what had happened is um, my autobiography, which mm. was released, because um, I nearly lost my best friend Martin Kemp. Sure. Right. Then I had a really heavy lawsuit with Paulie Yates and Michael Hutchinson, my best friend from NXS. Well, this is for the content of the autobiography? No, 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 no. This is before the autobiography. And um, we didn't lose Martin. Martin luckily had a brain tumour and they managed yeah. to sort of... Keep, sort it out, yeah. he, he survived. Um, afterwards... Um, I, I, I won't go into what this lawsuit with the national newspaper was, but it was very detrimental to my career. And mm. I said to Paula and Michael, I'm not letting this happen to me. Sure. Uh, and Paula said, please stick with us because otherwise I, I will lose my children. It mm. was all drug related, but that's yeah. all I'm going to yeah. say. Sure. So it took a year out of my life, but it was a year from hell. Yeah. And all I can think of is that after winning that, um, 
Like, I, I rang Michael the day that we won the case, and Michael said, I'm leaving Los Angeles, I'm going to Australia. Okay. Can you help Paula move from Chelsea to Fulham? And I went over to Paula's, and I noticed Paula was like drinking a bit of red wine. Um, I was helping her pack to move from Chelsea to Fulham. And then I get a call about two days later, and somebody says, you're not going to believe it. Don't leave your house. You're going to be surrounded by paparazzi. Michael's dead. And I went, oh, fuck off, and put the phone down. Yeah. And then my phone rang <clears> again, and they said, it's Steve, it's Monica. Michael's dead. He's been found, mysteriously hung. And it, like, really didn't, with, with Martin and then Michael, having fought for a year to win this case. Yeah. And then, the, then to top it all, Paul has attempted suicide. Sure. I then decided I'm out of London. I don't want anything to do with London. And I'd been approached by various book publishers from 1999 to 2000 to write my own book. Mm. Sure. I then decided when Paula died, maybe I, it's my time. I, Michael's gone, Paula's gone, we've saved Martin, but maybe I'm the third one that's gonna go. Mm. So I decided to do my autobiography, and I didn't, I thought my book would do relatively well. I didn't think it would go to number two in the bestseller. Then um, I thought, well, these people are spending nearly 20 pounds on the hardback. Um, then it came out in paperback, and I was being asked by the here and now tour people, would I like to, to join a revival? Yeah, do the yeah. The, yeah, do the here and now tours, mm -hmm. which I'd been turning down for a long period of time, for at least three to four years. Mm. Um, but then I thought, well, these people are spending 20 pounds on the book. The least I can do is like take part in a here and now tour. The reason I did the German TV show was because Fade to Grey was voted single of the decade. Ah, of course, yeah. okay. Oh, okay, awesome. So when did Visage that we have now, this lovely single and album, when did this begin? Is it 2011, 2010? You thought about putting it back together? Um, it most probably took about three years right. to, for the album to be fully, most probably three and a half sure. for the album to be fully recorded mm -hmm. because um, the name we mentioned earlier, the ex-drummer, um, was going to be involved in, in the, uh, the return of Visage, but mm -hmm. we were at each other's throat so much. Um, friends of ours, like from Spandau Ballet, who shall rena rename Nameless, tried everything to try to make him see the light of day, that it was gonna be a great album. Um, well, he didn't get involved so yeah. because basically I wanted, the, I wanted to put the band together yeah. for it to go on the road. And sure. Johnny Marta, who plays drums live on the road, uh -huh. actually blows Rusty away anyway. Get that. <laughs> <laughs> um, he does. I mean, it might take an hour and a half miking up and a sound check, but oh my God, when I do my costume change, they do two instrumentals. Yeah and they're on stage literally in their own elements, yeah. like Steve doing slap bass, Robin doing guitar, Logan doing keyboards, me and Lauren helping each other change hats and frocks <laughs> and heels and whatever else, and Johnny on drums, and I mean, they are just one shit hot band. Where did you find Lauren, by the way? What? She's the newest addition, I guess, right? Yeah, she, I, um, after the fallout with the ex-drummer, I decided I wanted to work with people that wanted to go on the road with me. Mm. Yeah. And she was a sort of a muse I was working with in another project I had on the go called the Detroit Stars. And I'd done this track for Microsoft mm. and it was called Destroy the Halo for the Xbox game Halo. Oh, right. yeah. And um, Lauren was singing on it. And um, afterwards I said to the record label who were putting this together. I can't work with him. I'm walking away from the project. Anyway, after about a month, they called up and they said, well, without you in the band, it isn't Visage, mm. and the record company doesn't want to know. And basically, the person is, is actually asking too much because we have a producer, he can't be the producer, blah, 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 blah. 
So I said, well, I want this to happen now. I want to write the rest of the album with Steve Barnacle. And I also want to introduce uh, this new muse. And she's got the voice of an angel. She will add a lot of dimension to the album. The new layer. Lauren Duval. And she has. She's actually, she's enhanced my vocals. And she's great on stage. That's and awesome. how, how does this sort of creative process work? Do you write at all? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I write mainly with Steve. Do the others write with you at all? Or? I write mainly with Steve Barnacle. Okay. Robin will always put his um, magic on his um, um, guitar, mm. you know, solos. Um, yeah. And also there is another silent writer by the name of John Bryan who writes with us as well. Okay. Mick McNeil, he's from Simple Minds. You see the he keyboardist. He some keyboards, some yeah. On it, He'll right? be doing some work on the new, not the classic, although we've got the new, um, n there, uh, um, sorry, where, where are we tomorrow? Larry Ann Show. Yeah, yeah. Larry Ann Show tomorrow, but yeah. I mean, I am tomorrow I'm working on a new song on it for the new Visage album, which is called Six Inch Heels. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, and um, w with Logan, Logan Sky, who's Well, that's where you've actually just come from, isn't it? Recording. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been polishing up the, the synth classic album with the Prague Philharmonic Orchestra. Mm -hmm. mm. And sorry. And um, the, the conductor actually flew in from Prague for two days. Um, we'll actually I link the listeners to that on the web page, actually. The yeah. The, yeah, because the track never enough it's eight minutes long but it's i think it i don't think they'll get bored i think they'll oh no it's it. beautiful uh, it's, it's only on for like t there's only a two minute clip actually on youtube but you can really tell it's going to kick off and then it abruptly ends unfortunately but it sounds amazing so i think that you should do more you should do a whole album of uh well, if they can, i'll sign this and they can win one of these okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> amazing and boy george took that and hopefully, Mr. O'Dowd, you keep your promise and you're going to do the direction for the video. For <laughs> she's electric. Thank you, George. Yeah, come into the video, George. We love you. Oh, I didn't know this either. You uh, let me in a little secret. And I don't do many Visage fans know this. Visage has four meanings. Yeah. If you break the word up, there's a bit of uh, not numerology, but uh, wordology in it. Well, everyone knows it's French for face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the VIS is for the visual side, meaning that the photography and the videos will always remain like a very permanent factor. Like our videos to me represent mini movies. Um, a lot of them have won awards. Um, a lot of our album covers have won awards. Um, and I will still, I hate calling it a brand, but mm -hmm. I will fight for the right, even though it's an independent label, mm -hmm. to still put out great sleeves and I mean the guy from the Times who reviewed Hearts and Knives mm -hmm. he said reviewing this on the merits of the sleeve alone it should be hanging in the Tate Gallery as a piece <laughs> of art oh. and I hope um, what is in this cover um, lives up to the cover because mm -hmm. if it does then I have to give it a 10 out of 10 and he did it does it's amazing and it's, it's almost like casting off the old image but bringing something Bring into it, into it, new, it yeah. symbolizes that perfectly. Awesome. And before we go, I have heard a rumor that you and, uh, is it Gary, are going to try and redo the Blitz? Gary Kemp? I, I heard that somewhere. Oh, no. Excuse my friend. <laughs> um, <coughs> what is happening with the Blitz? The Blitz is pivotal. It's a pivotal part of history. Yeah. As I said to you, um, my nephews who are, to me, like, Mini me's, but I mean, they they are just great kids. Um, it can't be recreated. The Blitz, it cannot. I mean, um, unfortunately, I don't think, and I'm not dissing today's teenagers. I don't think there is a a creative. How can I word this without sounding like? <laughs> I am being like rude about. You like, can be rude. You're Steve Strange. You started all this shit. Come on. It's sort of an area, and it was a time where we were in deep depression. We had strikes. We had mining strikes. Mm. We Thatch had no electric. 
We had no, hardly no money. There was no power. There was no hot water. We couldn't watch television. It was Thatcher's Britain. And the slogan was, the party, the ship's going down. But the thing with us was the ship was going down, but we wanted to party harder. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, to us, it was a form of escapism. Yeah. Now, what happened was that in that batch of Blitz, luckily, it was a contemporary part of St. Martin's, the millionaire Stephen Jones, mm. the designers John Galliano, Melissa Kaplan, John Flat, who's no longer with mm. us, Stephen Linnard, Stephen Jones on hats, bands such as Depeche Mode, Soft Cell, Human League, Associates from Scotland. That's when it went completely high and completely went, com not just like UK, went Wales, Scotland, everywhere. Yeah. Even from the Welsh side, you had Blue Run to the Turk. You had basically so many bands that were sort of coming, Soft Cell, Depeche Mode. Um, and it was a time, like the house band was Spano Ballet. And obviously Visage, it was, what I'm doing is I'm doing a gig in, in Leek, in sort of near Stoke-on-Trent, and it's in a brilliant place. Um, I did a gig there recently um, after I come back from Japan. Um, Anthony, who is the organizer, wants to recreate the Blitz, and I've said it won't happen. Mm. You cannot do this. Because it's made up of the people uh, who come into it, really. It's not just, yeah, you can't uh, just stick a club there and call it the Blitz and have it be the and same. And it's all right for everybody to come in wearing maybe frilly shirts yeah. and dressing mm. as maybe mm. little Lord Fauntleroy or <laughs> like they're part of the Russian Revolution. Well, that was your look in the mind of a toy video, wasn't that like crazy <laughs> Twilight Zone marionette look you had? That was great. With, with all the furniture upside down. Yeah. From it's an amazing ceiling. video. Um, but, you know, it's no, all we're doing is we're doing a set, a visage set, and then after we're doing a playlist from the Blitz. But um, this is the first I've heard that Gary's involved. I think Gary might. I've read have it on a website. It said Gary and Steve were thinking of resurrecting the Blitz. I'll try and find it and I'll have it Are sent you sure? to you. Sure. Yeah. Or has it not been on Twitter? <laughs> might have been on Twitter. I'll find it. I'll go back and I'll find it tonight and I'll send Internet, it to you. Home it's, uh, so, yeah. Home of basis rules. So, we when will out, this guys. go out? Oh, um, well, it'll be probably next week, beginning of next week. Yeah. Or Monday or Tuesday, or I reckon. Week, I suppose, yeah. Are you coming tomorrow? Yes, yes yeah. I've rearranged definitely. things so we can accompany you, sir. Okay. Yeah. I was also wondering, actually, though, um, for this latest album, um, independent record, independent label, um, you'll, you put it out on. Um, I mean, independent, um, yeah, not sort of one of the big companies. H how, why was that? And sort of was, the, was, the, was that a positive thing? Was it, has it been um, um, a good experience? Or... Did you talk it's George into it as well? Because yeah, okay. he's released, he's, he's done independent as well, hasn't he? With this is what I do. With his money. own money. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish it was my own money. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have as much as him. I mean, mine. Um, uh, unlike him, he was advised very wisely. Um, me, um, sadly, not advised as so as, as so well advised as George. Um, there are some great things about independent labels, mm. but you do get much more, how can I say, um, if it was universal, mm. universal, um, as I said to you, with um, uh, the back catalogue and the cheaper priced album they released, right. reviewing this album, if, if it was with them, they know the history of Visage, so it's not right. a, like an uphill fight all the time. Right, right. I'm having to fight all the time for like artistic, um, like creative, License. like, yeah, yeah, for covers and like, right, no, right. I don't want that. Then they'll send me to a photographer and I'm like, well, this might turn out quite nasty because you haven't showed me any of the guy's work sure. yeah. and you know what I'm like. If I don't like the work, I will walk. And they're like, well, there'll be a makeup artist there. Well, what? <laughs> well, it might not be doing my makeup yeah. because Lara needs to be there with me or Max needs to be. That's yeah. exactly the way I am. And it's not me being a diva. They just haven't got used to it yeah. yet. No, they're no just, it's they not me being a diva. They're slowly now, like this after is the way you a do year, things. Yeah. They're slow I, I let them have carte blanche with one video mm. and it's called Dreamer I Know. Mm. The video's okay-ish, mm. but... 
if they'd let me have that money they spent on it, I would have come up with like something better. Yeah, because I have like not just by um, the talks I do. In you've got the, the pedigree, program. haven't you? Yeah, but it's yeah. also I have like um, on followers, and I have people like from Solvent Uni or mm. or St Martin's who are doing film yeah. Yeah. that really want to actually aspire to become so they they yeah. just jump at the chance yeah, yeah, to, to do something like, really amazing yeah. Sure. yeah so you know now they're actually listening to me and mm -hmm. saying uh, like for instance john pleased women is on there and it took me three tracks to get a remix of john pleased women and now i've got man parish oh, who wow. was like the huge gay icon yeah. dj from america man parish has just done a remix of she's electric but they were like even when i said about um, my friend from ministry of sound lucas white wants to do a remix well ministry of sound is not really relevant and i'm like yeah. what <laughs> what do you mean they're not relevant and now they're like taking my ideas on board especially with john please women and also like i just said man parish yeah and i think now they're sort of starting to get to grips when we um, you've got roots in that haven't you the trance scene and stuff uh, in ibiza right is that how you kind of know those guys um, that was yeah. I sort of found Ibiza and um, in the early eighties, and I just like found this place, and it was like, oh, I just thought, oh, I'll keep this quiet for a few years. <laughs> um, and obviously, I was, I was hanging out with quite a lot of jet set people there, and then I decided, mm, I've been offered a deal here, like to make do a party every month, and I was offered quite a lot of money. And I was flying the likes of Danny Ramplin, Judge Jules, to Fat Tony. And what I did was I destroyed it. <laughs> I actually destroyed my own little private <laughs> island. Oh. And I actually... Your own sanctuary. You kind of <laughs> turned <laughs> it into fucking San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> when can we expect this new album then that you've been uh, polishing the last couple of days? When, what's, the, what's your kind of general release or have you got a thing on it? Yeah. I'm hoping um, within four months for the synth classic album mm. and we start work now. I'm starting work hopefully this weekend on Six Inch Heels, which will be the first track and full circle for the new Visage album. That's very really exciting. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, yeah, if, if George can hopefully do a video for you as well. Well, hopefully, but that'll be the last track of this album. Yeah. She's electric. Oh, and one thing I do have to say is, because um, um, I did so much help and David Bowie um, gave this album like a really big thumbs up. Yeah. Um, my friend Mark Wardell, the artist, yeah. um, got commissioned by Bowie to do the, the sculptured mask yeah. of Aladdin Sane. And the Ziggy Stardust, mm -hmm. and uh, I he just called me up about three days ago and said, "Why don't we do five visage masks?" Mm. And I said, "Really?" <laughs> so they're going to do the Fata Gray. They're going to yeah. do the one with the Japanese logo, the snake, and Brilliant. possibly this is going to be the special edition one. Well, that sure. one's beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful. What was the inspiration behind that cover? What's the sort of... Um, it's breaking oh. away from fade yeah. to grey. Right, of course, then yeah. <coughs> my yeah. head breaking through a mirror, so my, my eyebrows become like mirrored eyebrows. Yeah. So the and shattered glass as your head like crashes through it into the future. With the yeah. Music. yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> so yeah, Lauren, Steve, Robin, and... Uh, <coughs> Logan. Logan. And Who Steve Barnacle. Barnacle, yeah. Guys, you've done a really fantastic album. I'm just saying that because Steve's like sitting here. One of the reasons I wanted you on, because I've always wanted to meet you, because I love you. Uh, but this album made me go, oh my God, Steve Strange. He's like back and he's current. Not only that, he's li it's just really good. I'm not just kissing your ass because you're on the show. Oh, thank it's fantastic. You. Everyone go out and buy this uh, I've album. I've really enjoyed being on your show. Thank, <laughs> thank you very you. much. Well, hopefully thank when the new you. album comes out and the one after that, please do come on again. We'll uh, yeah. happy to promote it it's for been you. It's been wonderful to have you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks <laughs> very really much. The time has I flown. <laughs> and don't forget, the person who I'll sign this. Oh, yeah. yeah. And someone can win this, okay? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So, yes, guys, uh, the links to the new album 
uh, will be on the website, so please go out and buy it. It really is fantastic. Uh, I can't say enough about this. As a fan of electronic music and like fascinated with the new romantic movement, uh, it's an honor, sir, to have you here. I can't believe we've got you on by episode six. I can't <laughs> believe I'm sitting here <laughs> looking at Steve Strange going, oh my God, it's And Steve we've Strange. got a date, three of us tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, We're all on a big date tomorrow <laughs> to see Larry Ann, who was episode four. So uh, yeah, uh, thank you to Larry Ann for making this possible and Ricky Dance. And Lillian and Robert Perino. Oh, guys. Lillian and Ricky are brilliant. And I mean, that was so sweet what um, uh, Robert put on, on of me. Um, he, <laughs> uh, that I am he's the a real he's living a, he's legend. Lovely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he's very, very questionable. Past, present <laughs> and future, hopefully. Uh, don't change, Steve. Keep going. Uh, you're you. amazing. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, better things, even better things than this, if it's even possible are ahead of us. Thank uh, you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Oh, do you have a Twitter? Or? Oh, yes. yes. I am on Steve Viz Strange. Mm -hmm. Don't go on to Facebook, please, because <laughs> I'm not rude. I would accept you, but unfortunately, I He's can't. He's got too many friends. May <laughs> way too Alex many. tried that today, actually. That's go why. on visage.cc and you can be accepted on that yeah. okay. but real friends know my real name go on that and you can be accepted you can sample the album <laughs> also at uh, visage soundcloud the real visage yeah. on soundcloud as well so you want to have a look at the tracks a few a little clip of each one uh, utterly fantastic check it out get the album and uh, yeah what's um, your twitter alex where can people well, find people you <laughs> can find me at alex consuelo yeah, and you can find me at Ethan McKinley UK. So, uh, yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Visage. Keep them coming, baby. But you haven't sent Steve his stranger Twitter. <laughs> I haven't. I, well, there's lots of fake ones, Soon actually. I don't know which one was you. There's There'll a couple a of, like, one. not Steve, Steve Strange, but isn't you. There's, no. like, there's fan stuff on There'll there. There'll be a verified one, I'm sure, though. Yeah. Just say verified on it. Steve which is the real S. Steve Viz. Steve Viz. Steve I, Steve V I S Strange. Okay. Steve yeah. V I S Strange is the real Twitter. Except no substitutes. And uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks again for coming on and thank you for listening and Until watching. Until next time. Bye. Bye. I can't believe that's two hours gone.